Welcome back, everybody. This is the second the second talk of this second section of uh, the, the, the track one of the second day of State of the Map, this particular State of the Map all online. Uh, I'm glad to introduce to you to, to this talk, uh, Daniel Schorlemer, that is the leader of the testing and evaluation program for the global earthquake model in German, in the German Research Center in uh, Potsdam, in particular for the focus for geoscience. I remind to you that when during the talk you have question, you should, the questioner could be done, could be asked inside the, the pod that you can find on the State of the Map website. You, you can go and there, are, there is space for every question and we are going to reply after in the Q&A session. The, the talk will be focused on the possibility to use uh, the OSM data as an input for an expositor module to transform the, the earthquake hazard to a building damage, human and financial losses. Hi, I'm Daniel Schorlemmer. I'm a seismologist and risk researcher at the German Research Center for Geosciences. My work is centered around earthquakes and their risk to society. Research is usually not done alone. Therefore, I would like to introduce my collaborators from all around the globe that have significantly contributed to this work. I have put all their names onto the slide. Earthquakes pose a significant risk to around a third of the world's population. Here you can see the effects of the mega-earthquake and tsunami that hit the east coast of Japan in 2011. Japan is one of the countries with the highest chance to be rattled by earthquakes. In 1923, the great Kanto earthquake destroyed many parts of Tokyo and Yokohama. More than 500,000 buildings were destroyed and more than 100,000 people lost their lives. It's only a matter of time before another large earthquake will hit the Tokyo area. What will Tokyo look like after the earthquake? What will any community around the world look like after an earthquake hits? What can these communities do to mitigate their risk? And how do we make communities understand their risk? Let me take you on a quick tour through the phenomenon of earthquakes and their impact on people and values. The birth of modern seismology can be dated back to 1906 after the great San Francisco earthquake in which, similar to the Great Kanto earthquake, many buildings were destroyed during the fires and its aftermath. It happened that shortly before the earthquake, the San Francisco Bay Area was geodetically surveyed, and this survey was repeated after the earthquake. The changes detected in comparing the measurements before and after the earthquake led to the conclusion that the earthquake was a result of motion along the San Andreas Fault, named after a lake in the San Francisco area that the fault line is crossing. We know today that this fault stretches all the way through the state of California to Mexico and that two major plates are moving horizontally along this fault. The picture here shows the very exposed and easily visible part of the San Andreas Fault in the Carrizo Plain in Central California. It should be mentioned that the fault is nowhere near to be seen as clearly in the Bay Area as it is in the Carrizo Plain. At many locations along the San Andreas Fault, geodetic measurements revealed that during the earthquake, the plates have suddenly moved by a few meters as can be seen in the photo of the shifted fence. As a result of these observations, modern seismology started with the so-called elastic rebound theory, basically stating that the plates are moving constantly but are stuck at their interface, in this case the San Andreas Fault. If the stresses due to the motion become too high, the fault cannot sustain them anymore and gives way for another sudden motion at the fault interface, which actually is an earthquake. The fact that this behavior is repeating approximately every century can be seen by a shifted creek in the Carrizo Plain that I visited some 15 years ago. This shift is the result of many earthquakes moving the right part, the North American continent, towards the viewer in this photo. The major finding in these observations was the fact that large earthquakes are generated along large faults. Therefore, seismological and geological activities were focused in mapping these sources of earthquakes to create models that can forecast the locations of future earthquakes in order to help countries to prepare for the coming disasters. Here you see a map of major faults in Japan, and it is pretty obvious that at least moderate earthquakes can occur almost anywhere in the country. But the world is still experiencing what we can call surprise earthquakes, 
the earthquake that shook Kobe in Japan for 20 seconds destroyed or heavily damaged more than 100,000 buildings and more than 4,500 people died. The surprising factor was the fact that the fault underneath Kobe causing the earthquake was not known before. This catastrophe has led to significantly improved building codes in Japan. Only 25 years later, in Tokyo alone, more than 70% of the buildings are now built according to these codes. However, not only the location of faults are important to understand earthquake hazard. Let's return to San Francisco, where the Loma Prieta earthquake, 1989, destroyed buildings in the Marina District and a highway in the Oakland area, shown here. Although the fault causing this earthquake was known for almost 100 years, another key parameter influences the destruction, the local underground. Very dangerous are unconsolidated soft soils and sediments which amplify the shaking. One can imagine them as a wobbly pudding that is shaking for much longer than the stiff rock. It is the irony of history that the Marina District and the highway location in Oakland are areas in which the rubble of the 1906 earthquake was used as a poorly consolidated landfill. The destructions in 1989 can therefore be considered a consequence of the 1906 event. This graphic nicely shows the effects that different types of sites can have on the surface shaking. This ranges from solid bedrock, where shaking is comparatively the weakest, over well-consolidated sediments with some amplification, to poorly consolidated sediments with comparatively stronger shaking. In case of water-saturated sediments, liquefaction can occur, an effect in which the formerly solid sediments behave like a liquid during the shaking, making building foundations move or turn over, or buildings sink into the ground. As a consequence, the most important product of seismological research are earthquake hazard maps that combine the location and probability of earthquakes with the site conditions to express locally the probabilities to experience certain degrees of shaking. The hazard map of Japan shows a different image than the map of active faults. The highest hazard, shown in red, is concentrated in the flat areas, which are covered by sediments. Unfortunately, these are not only the agricultural areas, but also the locations of the biggest cities in Japan. Probabilities of shaking levels are not the best way to communicate the danger of earthquakes to people, communities, or municipalities. It is anything but easy to understand how a particular level of shaking will affect a building or a town. And it not only depends on the earthquake itself and the site conditions, but also on the buildings themselves and how resistant they are to shaking. The effects that earthquakes have on buildings and people are called risk, which itself is a combination of the earthquake hazard locally, the types of buildings and their distribution, called exposure, and the vulnerability of each of these types of buildings to the shaking. Therefore, a risk estimate describes the expected long-term building damage and loss of lives. But we know that while the earthquake hazard does not change strongly over time, the exposure is very dynamic. The building stock is changing constantly over time. Cities are growing, and with it the number of people. Also, in many countries, the building stock changes in terms of vulnerability, with old buildings being removed and new buildings following new and better building codes. Therefore, monitoring the changes in exposure allows us to monitor the dynamics of the risk people are exposed to. Monitoring the risk gives us the means to communicate risk in detail to the affected people. And it gives us the means to understand how we have to shape our cities and communities to reduce the risk they are exposed to. The goal of our so-called global dynamic exposure model is to describe every building on Earth in respect to the key exposure indicators. Exact location and size, the type of building and its vulnerability to earthquakes to assess potential degrees of damage, the replacement value to assess the economic losses and the number of people inside each building during an earthquake to estimate the number of casualties and injured people. Knowing all these indicators will allow us to completely model the impact of earthquakes on people, buildings, communities and cities. Our challenge is to create a dynamic exposure model that monitors any change to the building stock to be able to precisely capture the fast urbanization in many areas of the world. And because every building is different, we want our model to be of highest possible resolution, the building scale.
Classically, exposure models are created by engineers analyzing the building stock of a city and describing it as aggregates with varying resolution. It is obvious that there are not enough engineers on the world to inspect every building and determine its size, type and value. Therefore, we are going a completely different way. We are developing our model around crowdsourcing of building relevant information to be able to capture the whole world. What other platform is more suited than OpenStreetMap for this endeavor? We are combining OSM data with other open data where available and expert knowledge to estimate the key exposure indicators for each building based on the proxy values that we can access through OSM, like footprint, number of stories or occupancy type. Each building is dynamically processed and exposure data is delivered as a web service, following standard taxonomies to describe the key features of each building. We are updating our local copy of OSM every 60 seconds and immediately processing all changes. Out of this processing, all buildings that require an assessment of their exposure indicators are identified and placed into computational queues to be processed at the next possible time. This usually only takes a few minutes. The entire processing is algorithmic and all exposure indicator interpretations are based on expert rules, making this exposure model fully reproducible and documented as no expert guessing takes place. Let's have a look at a very complete example of our exposure model. Here you see the downtown area of San Francisco with each building colored according to its occupancy type. Red colors indicate residential use, yellow educational and blue commercial. Light blue is used for various types of assemblies, that is cultural or transportation related buildings. Orange indicates governmental brown industrial buildings and purple is used for mixed types of occupancy. As you can see, the occupancy type is assigned to each building separately. We are using land use information, building tags and points of interest to derive the best guess of the occupancy type for each building. Let's look at the connection of our exposure model to earthquakes. Here you see the building types that we derived for each building based on various parameters like shape, occupancy, number of stories, etc. We are following the standard building types as defined for the US. The inset on the top left shows the aforementioned Marina District in Northern San Francisco, just to highlight the fact that we performed all computation for each single building separately. You can see that the residential suburbs to the west are predominantly covered with wood frame homes shown in red, while in the downtown area we can see many different building types, in particular the steel frame concrete buildings shown in bluish colors. Let us now shake the whole city with an earthquake. We have chosen an event very similar to the earthquake that hit the city in 1989 and caused the damage in the Marina District and in Auckland. What you see here is the maximum level of shaking measured in G per location. As mentioned before and nicely visible here, the local site conditions have a profound impact on the level of shaking. To understand the shaking at each building site, we interpolate the simulated shaking down to the building scale. Now that we know for each building its type and vulnerability to shaking and the level of shaking it was exposed to during the earthquake, we can compute the probability of each building to be completely destroyed. The probability to be destroyed is very small for almost all buildings in San Francisco given this earthquake. But we can also compute the probability to be extensively damaged. Moderately damaged. Or slightly damaged. These computations now will give us a clear picture of what is likely to happen to the city of San Francisco in such an earthquake. We can also see that the Marina District has an overall higher chance to experience damage than most other parts of the city, as was indeed observed after the 1989 earthquake. One can ask whether or not this level of detail is necessary. The answer is yes, details matter. Just ask these cows after the 2016 Kaikoura earthquake in New Zealand. The underground can react differently on relatively small scales. To give you some examples with buildings, here you see some building blocks strongly affected by liquefaction of the underground. While the two rows of buildings on the left hand side are tilted and some almost tumbled, the buildings on the right hand side have not moved. 
Christchurch, New Zealand, was struck by a series of earthquakes in 2011. Some parts of Christchurch were heavily affected by liquefaction and even partly flooded due to the uprising water. On the photo taken right after the earthquake, you can see the part west of the river was flooded while the eastern part was not affected. As a consequence, the city of Christchurch has designated so-called residential red zones in which all buildings were removed and no further developments were allowed. This was a very effective measure to reduce losses in future earthquakes. Here's another example showing you on what a small scale the location of a building can make a difference between complete destruction and a relatively low level of damage. It is important to know whether or not you live in a house on the left or right side of the yellow line. The ability to communicate on this level the risk building owners or tenants are exposed to can trigger necessary reinforcements of buildings or other risk mitigation strategies. Exposure models describe exactly this aspect of the earthquake risk chain that we can change to create safer cities. Shortly after the 2016 Kumamoto earthquake in Japan, I visited the affected area. Here you see the surface trace of the fault that ruptured and how it shifted the ground. Buildings very close to the fault, experiencing a high level of shaking, were destroyed. But further away, it was often the type and quality of buildings that made a difference. Here you see two buildings that were exposed to the same level of shaking. The building in the front completely collapsed, while the building in the back retained its overall shape, despite likely being structurally damaged. It may be uninhabitable in the future, but the people inside have likely survived the earthquake. Most likely it was later tagged as unsafe after manual inspection by engineers. A lot of buildings that on the first glimpse looked okay were tagged as unsafe because they lost their structural integrity. They will all need to be completely removed and replaced by new buildings. I also visited the emergency management group in Kumamoto. Their main job was to understand how many buildings were damaged beyond repair and how many people they expect to be homeless after the earthquake. These numbers are most important in the direct aftermath of such an event to be able to correctly plan for sufficient supply for the population. Only if the building situation is known sufficiently well, the number of shelters needed can be reasonably estimated. A model delivering this information will be able to speed up this process from many days to a few minutes and provide the emergency managers with the data needed to most efficiently help the affected population and provide the necessary shelters for the homeless. I hope I was able to make the case for good building data in OSM and to convince you that every building detail in OSM can contribute to mitigating and understanding risks. How can you contribute and what are we looking for? Obviously, we need the footprints of all buildings, preferably together with the number of stories. They provide the location and size of the building and give us hints to the building type and its replacement value. The occupancy coded in the building tag, the building use tag, or through points of interest help us assess the number of people per time of the day that are likely in the building. And all of the simple 3D tags describing the roof and the outside material can give us further clues to the type and value. Even not being visible on the standard map, all these extra tags provide valuable information that we translate into an exposure model to understand the building specific risk. This exposure model can be used to improve earthquake resilience of communities and their preparedness planning. It helps in rapid loss assessments as shown for the scenario earthquake in San Francisco. In upcoming projects, we're including communities in Taiwan and Japan to increase their risk awareness and help them understand their possible mitigation measures. Our goal is that after the expected big earthquake that will hit Tokyo sometime in the future, the city will not look like after the 1923 earthquake. With this, I want to thank you for your attention. I hope I was able to get my ideas across and to generate some interest in building data and OpenStreetMap. You can visit our website for more information or contact me at any time. I hope to see you all at next year's State of the Map, wherever it might be. Thanks again and goodbye. Life. Thank you very much, Dania, for your very interesting talking about.
the, 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 the interface between OS, OpenStreetMap and Quakes. We have some question that we had in the pod. So I just start with the first one. So uh, it's say there is a very interesting example, the, the example of San Francisco. It's great, but the, the, the that was thanks to a uh, data import from the project of uh, Gov Open Data. What will happen in the country when the government doesn't want to share this data to a SAM because there they might be cor corruption or some uh, construction lesson that they gave? Mm. You are muted. Well, not anymore, right? You can hear me. Um, no, no, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. yes so we have, for this talk, uh, we have particularly selected San Francisco because of the high level of detail to actually really make the case of why it is important to know about everything about the buildings. But we're not limited to an area where we have a complete building stock. So uh, the, the general approach that we take is that we um, subdivide the, uh, the country or the city into basically tiles, we call it cells. And for each cell, we estimate uh, the expected number of buildings through remote sensing or other sources. And then we distribute classical exposure models to all of these buildings. And as buildings are coming on in, into OpenStreetMap, we specify this aggregated exposure into a building by building type exposure. So if we have all the buildings, like in the in case of San Francisco, we give a building specific um, risk assessment. If we don't have it, we go by the zoom level 18 tiles, so 150 meters, and have the aggregates at these locations. So we can basically always make a statement, sometimes with higher uh, precision than others. Okay, thanks. There is a very similar question about these topics. Uh, for mm, for knowing the risk of, of the, for knowing the risk of the building is necessary to know the exactly position and the level of the buildings. But what about the risk of the road? Um, well, if the road is very close, and uh, then we can uh, make a probabilistic assessment whether or not the road will likely be blocked with the debris of the building. Um, that, of course, can only be a probabilistic assessment because we uh, cannot definitely say how a building will react. We give probabilities as shown in the um, presentation. And also, there is a particular probabilistic function that given a particular type of damage, there will be a lot of debris uh, on the road. So the uh, proximity of the road to buildings can be a very important factor. And what we have not shown in this talk is we also run simulations of a realization of what happens. So we say, okay, each uh, we give in, we run a Monte Carlo simulation um, assigning each building a particular damage state. And then we can add um, which of these buildings potentially block roads. And then um, you know you can run different simulations based on that if you like. For instance, what is the uh, passage time or the way that somebody has to take going from a damaged building where you have to expect injured people to the next working hospital because the direct road may be blocked. Thanks. Very clear. There is a, uh, for the research is needed a digital elevation model external from the data of OSM. It's or is not needed. Well, that's actually a pretty good question. For what we're doing in terms of earthquakes, it is not very much needed. Sometimes the slope uh, can give us an additional information, but the point is that an exposure model is essentially hazard agnostic. Only when you assign vulnerabilities to a building, you are defining the hazard that you're looking at. Let me give you an example. For earthquakes, of course, it is important what kind of structural integrity a building has, what material it has been built off. If you look into the hazard of floodings, then it's most important to know whether this building has a basement or not, because that will run full of water. And while talking about floodings, um, the digital elevation model here is extremely important, because then we can assess the chance of a building being exposed to a flood or to the water coming in uh, into the basement of that very house and destroy it. Thanks. There is a, sim a question there that maybe is before answer, maybe there can be a more complex answer. The lack of ge geological data on, on OSM and NOFT uh, among the open data is a limit for the model. Sorry, I, wrong, I read it wrong before. It is, it's totally new. So the lack of this geological data is something that limits the model. 
or there is, there will this type of data improve the model? Um, it is uh, independent of this data. This is an exposure model. It basically des describes the buildings, so say the assets. It describes where the people are at what time of the day and what the value or say replacement cost of these buildings is. The geological data comes into play into the hazard model. So if you want to you know, create a good risk assessment, you need a good hazard model and a good exposure model. And so we are focusing here on the pure exposure part. And we have to assume, like everybody else, that the people who do the hazard model do it the best way. And that is not necessarily open data that goes in, but the hazard models that we use as, um, uh, as basis for computing the risk, they are open. OK, we have just, if you have, if in the public there are some more questions, we have some few minutes to write it. We have just one last comment that he said, in most of the informal cities, buildings did not apply for permits, and they are, in fact, illegal. So any mapping of them is rather sensitive. How, this, I think it's a refer to something to say before, if you have some other comments to add to these, uh, to these statements. Um, yeah, sure. Um, I, I see that point. Um, but I think what we're doing is we're not going into these cities and mapping. We're taking what is an open street map, which has been mapped. So if for some reason people don't want this to be mapped, then they may, you know, remove that data or not. Um, we are just taking every building that we find in OpenStreetMap and try to squeeze out the most of information that is in OpenStreetMap in terms of exposure and vulnerability to put it into uh, our exposure model to run the risk calculation. So thank you very much. We don't have uh, any, any other questions. Thanks to Daniel for your very interesting presentation about these different models, that can be, the different use that can be done with the OSM. So thank you very much. I thanks also to the, all the technical team since he's my last uh, set track talk as, as host. So thank you very much, uh, Father Trapper, for your work and your support during these talks. And uh, see you in a, in a next uh, set of the map, maybe in person and not virtual. I hope Bye. so. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.